Hello, welcome to another lecture on uh, linked data. And today, again, we'll have two main topics. One will be Shackle, uh, which is an RD vocabulary, and it is also a, a language for validating RDF data, which is something we have not seen before. And the second topic will be um, mapping relational databases to RDF. Uh, regarding that, we have seen Tarkle, which took uh, CSV files as an input, and uh, using Sparkle construct, you could create RDF representation of the data, but we'll focus on uh, another web standard, which again will be an RDF vocabulary, using which you can specify mapping from a relational database uh, to, uh, to RDF. Okay, so um shackle um is uh, as i said an rdf vocabulary and uh, it is a solution to the uh, feature and a problem of rdf uh, which is uh, called or uh, referred to as a schema less rdf um, when we talked about how you can actually load data into RDF databases and how you can model data so that it can be stored and processed as RDF and maybe published as RDF, uh, we talked about the difference from modeling data for relational databases, because for a relational database, you need to first create a schema, then you can load the data into the relational database according to that schema. And when your needs change and you need to change the schema, uh, because for instance, you have new data, you need to change the schema first, which can be costly, and then you can add new data to the database. Um, so uh, in contrast with RDF, uh, in RDF, everything is an RDF triple, uh, and uh, the RDF triples is the data model. So anything that fits RDF triples can be loaded into an RDF database. Um, and therefore, when you have uh, some data uh, in your system and you need to add more data, you can simply add more triples and you don't have to worry about changing the schema first. So that is what is referred to as the schema less uh, RDF or the fact that RDF is schema less. Now, this may seem as an advantage and it is for uh, data publishers. But then uh, when you think about actually using uh, such RDF data that can change in structure and some uh, properties and classes can uh, appear and their instances also in the data and so on, uh, there may be some problems with uh, compatibility of your application because you need to always think about that this may happen, that some properties may be missing Maybe in some places where you expect one value, you can get a list of values and so on. So that's quite normal with RDF, but it makes creating uh, RDF applications a little bit harder because you need to always think about all these, uh, all these options and account for them in your application. What would be better uh, or what a developer would need is a schema or a set of rules that the data needs to comply with. And uh, then the application can be built um, against those rules. And uh, when the data does not follow the rules, it is clear where the fault is. Uh, so um, this is what Shackle can be, uh, can be used for. Um, you can describe using shapes how the RDF data should look like uh, using shapes and, and, and rules. Um, I wanted to mention something else. Uh, right, so maybe uh, we'll get to it a bit, uh, a bit later. So uh, the basic notion of Shackle is a shape, which is the shape of a data um, or a described shape, shape of, of some RDF data. Um, and uh, we'll have a set of shapes, set of rules that the RDF data needs to comply with. Um, and uh, this will again be described as an uh, or using an RDF vocabulary. Uh, and we will have these shapes in a so called shapes graph. So that will be uh, yet another RDF graph that we will work with shapes graph with the rules. And then we will have our data in our data graph. 
And then we'll have a shackle validator, which is a software that takes a shapes graph, a data graph, and uh, runs the validation on top of the data and determines uh, whether or not the data is compliant with the shapes. And if not, it produces a validation report. Again, the validation report will be uh, represented as RDF data. Um, so uh, this is basically an RDF transformation, uh, technically. But uh, uh, yeah, what it does is it validates the data in the data graph using the shapes in the shapes graph. Now, uh, first, let's talk a bit uh, about how we can uh, specify which pieces of RDF data should be validated using a shape. So in this example, uh, we have uh, something called a node shape. You can uh, see that from the type. Uh, so we have a person shape, which is of a type shackle node shape, uh, which means it will target some RDF nodes. Nodes are identified by IRIs or they are blank nodes. So here we'll target some nodes. And in this particular case, we will target a particular node, a particular resource identified by the IRI X Alice. So this shape doesn't do anything yet because we don't have any validation rules on, uh, on it, but we already can see that it will target the node identified by the IRI X Alice. So on the left hand side, we have the shapes graph with the shapes, currently with one shape. And on the right hand side, we'll have the data graph, which we'll use for validation, uh, which we will try to validate using the shapes graph. So in this case, we will target Alice, who is a person. Then there is a Bob, who is a person, and New York, which is a place. And those nodes are not targeted by the shape. So um, yeah, this uh, shackle target node specifies an IRI of a node targeted by uh, that shape. We can also target a whole class of, uh, of nodes using a shape. So here we'll have target class and the IRI of a class X person. And now in the data graph, we have two people and both people will be targeted by, uh, by this shape in this case, not New York because New York is a place, not a person. Uh, now in Shackle, there is support for some basic RDFS inference which means that uh, Shackle, uh, a Shackle validator understands RDFS uh, and uh, particularly the subclass of uh, relation. So here we'll have uh, a class person as before, and we also have a class doctor, which is a subclass of person. Now we'll have an instance of doctor, we'll have doctor who, and uh, doctor who will be targeted by this node shape because, um, he is an instance of doctor, which is a subclass of person, which means that who is also an instance of person, and person is the class targeted by the shape. Then there is a house who is nephrologist, but there is no relation um, connecting nephrologist to a person. So based on this uh, data, uh, house will not be uh, targeted by this node shape. Uh, there is a syntactic shortcut kind of for the same functionality. So for targeting a class uh, and uh, it looks like this, when in the shapes graph, we say that some, something is an old shape and at the same time, it is an RDFS class. Then it is the same as saying that this shape targets this particular class. So here we'll uh, have an old shape which targets the X person class. So again, Alice and Bob uh, from the data graph will be targeted here. Now, node shapes can also target um, subjects of a certain predicate. So here we'll say that the node shape will target subjects of the predicate X nodes. So when we have a predicate X nodes, which connects some subjects to some objects, the subjects of this predicate in the data graph will be targeted by this node shape. And uh, in our data graph, this will be Alice because Alice is the subject of the X nodes uh, predicate. Bob is not a subject of the X nose predicate, so he is not targeted. We can also, uh, also, of course, target the object of some predicate. So in this case, Bob will be targeted because Bob is 
the object of the X knows uh, predicate. Uh, right, so those were node shapes. And uh, the other construct in, in Shackle is a property shape. And property shapes can be connected to node shapes, for instance, like this. So we'll have a node shape, example node shape with property shape, right? Uh, and uh, it will have a property shape connected using Shackle property. And the property shape is now a blank node, uh, <clears throat> which says that uh, on this targeted node, we need an uh, email predicate. Um, then we have <clears throat> a name and description, uh, which uh, doesn't have to do uh, or doesn't have anything to do with uh, validation. That's just description of uh, that shape for people so that people can understand what you mean by that shape. And then we have min count one, which uh, means that uh, on that node that is targeted by that node shape, we need at least one instance of the predicate X email. Uh, right. Uh, so in this case, uh, we have a, also a standalone property shape. So it is not connected to any node shape. It is a standalone. And basically what it says is that in our data graph, we need at least one instance or one usage of the X email predicate, which means that in the first data graph, this shape will, will fail because there is no uh, instance of the X email predicate. The second data graph will pass because there is the triple saying that Alice has email and some email. So um, the first graph will fail here. The second graph will pass. Um, uh, regarding property shapes, uh, we have seen that we can specify the predicate that we will, uh, we will validate or we will uh, focus on. Uh, but we uh, might also have noticed that this predicate was connected by the shackle path predicate. So why shackle path? Why not shackle predicate or something? Well, because uh, shackle also supports property paths the same um, property paths that Sparkle supports. So uh, actually last tutorial, we played a little bit with Sparkle. We have seen the usage of property paths. So uh, basically in Sparkle, you can go through a RDF graph uh, specifying the individual predicates to go through. You can go uh, in the direction of the predicate and in the inverse direction of the predicate. You can specify that you go uh, one, too many times through a certain predicate and so on. And the same thing can be specified here for shackle shapes. However, uh, shackle shapes are expressed in RDF. So we need to be able to express the same property paths in RDF. And this is how it is done in shackle. So we have seen already the first one, the most, uh, the, the simplest one where uh, the path is just a simple predicate. So then it is the same, right? The, the, the value of the path is the IRI of the predicate that we focus on. When we want to represent the inverse path, we already need to uh, use a little bit more complex construction uh, in, in, in RDF. And uh, this one is a blank node, which has a predicate Shackle inverse path. And the value of that is the predicate that we'll go through in the inverse direction. Um, we also have a sequence. Well, in RDF, we have the RDF list, so we all use it. So in Shackle, when we want to re represent a sequence of predicates, it is a list where the individual items are the predicates in that sequence. That's quite simple. And uh, when we want to um, represent the repetition, uh, we can again do it using a blank node with the Shackle zero or more path, for instance, and uh, the predicate that can be repeated so RDF is subclass of, when we repeat it, we basically traverse the um, class hierarchy defined by RDFS. And uh, the whole path is a list where the first predicate is RDF type and then zero or more times RDF is subclass of. There is also support for alternative paths and uh, for other types of uh, repetitions. Uh, so they differ only in uh, in the shackle predicate used on that blank node. So all these you can specify with a property shape using the uh, shackle path, 
And using those, you can specify which predicates are focused and what they need to satisfy. Uh, right. Uh, you can have more property shapes connected to one node shape. So in this case, we will have a node shape with two property shapes. One ensures that there is at least one email on that node. And the second one ensures that uh, the focus node of that shape actually knows someone who has an email. So there is an example of the sequence um, sequence here. So knows someone and someone has an email. And this needs to be there at least once. Right, so those were no shapes and property shapes. And when we run those through the validator on top of some data graph, when everything checks out, uh, the result will be like this. So it will be a validation report saying that uh, um, the data shape conforms to uh, the shapes. But that's not the interesting case. The more interesting case is when there is some kind of problem uh, where the shape doesn't fit the data. And then it looks like this. Let's have a simple data graph where we have a Bob who has age and his age is 22, but represented as a string, which is wrong, of course, but let's test for that. So we'll have this data graph and uh, the shapes graph on the right hand side says that uh, the node shape targets Bob and Bob has to have age and the age has to have the data type integer. That's one of the constraints that can be expressed using, uh, using Shackle. So that's the shape. And of course the shape is not fulfilled because the data type in the data graph is a string, not an integer. So the result of the validation report will be that the data shape is not conformant, uh, the, the data graph to the, to the shapes graph, and there will be a set of results. And each result, represents one uh, violation of a shape in the shapes graph. So in this case, we'll have a validation result. Um, result severity we'll talk about uh, in a bit. That's just a constant saying uh, how, how much um, it is a problem uh, that this um, shape doesn't fit. And it is up to the designer of the shapes to specify that. So. Um, yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But the focus node is Bob. That's the node that caused the problem. The result path is the predicate or the predicate uh, or the entire path that caused the problem. And uh, there is also the value that caused the problem. Um, so that's the focus node, the result path, and the value. And now uh, source constraint component specifies, uh, well, constraint component in Shackle is basically the validator. So this specifies the validator that uh, caused the, uh, the violation here. And uh, that's a Shackle data type constraint component. This is a predefined validator in Shackle. Um, so now we know that the problem is caused by um, a data type constraint. And there is also a link to the shape that caused the violation on that focus node, and that's the data type example shape. So as you can see in the validation report, where whenever there is a validation uh, violation, uh, there is a complete specification of the problem in the data. Uh, it points to the node, to the shape, to the path and the value, and the type of the problem. So based on that, you are able typically to fix the problem because it basically says everything it can say about that problem. Now, back to the shape severity. As I uh, already mentioned, this is something that you can specify on a shape. So here, for instance, we have a node shape targeting some instance, and we'll have two uh, node shape, uh, property shapes. One will check whether uh, there is uh, my property at least once, and it is of a type string. and uh, the severity here is warning. And uh, the second one says that uh, the property needs to have maximum length of 10, the value of it. And uh, there is no severity specified. The default is violation, as we have seen before. Uh, those are just constants that you can use when you create your shapes. They do not have any other meaning. Uh, there are three predefined values in the specification that you may use, but you can also use your own. The only effect is that the severity is then copied to the 
validation report whenever there is a validation uh, violation. Uh, and you can then use those to process the individual results uh, when you process the results. So here uh, we will see that both of those uh, will actually be validated, uh, <clears throat> will cause a violation because uh, in the data graph, we have a property which is not a string, it's a, a URI and it is longer than 10. So you'll have two, uh, two violations here. Uh, and uh, in the results, we can see that the first violation has uh, the uh, warning sever severity and the second has the violation severity, which is default when uh, nothing is specified. Now, uh, with each chakra shape, you can also specify a message that is to be copied again in, into the validation result when a violation occurs. Um, and basically, it should describe to uh, the reader uh, what went wrong and what can be done about that. Uh, right, one more thing. Oh, for debugging purposes, you can also say that a shape is deactivated, which means it will not uh, be applied, but it will still be present in the shapes graph. So here, we have a uh, person shape targeting person class, which means it will target John Doe over there, and uh, it links to a property shape. Now, note that uh, in this case, the property shape is not a blank node. It is a resource identified by an IRI, which is okay. And it is defined uh, in the bottom half of the slide. And this property shape uh, focuses on the name predicate. It has to be there at least once. As we can see in the data graph, that predicate is not there. So normally that shape will cause a violation, but it is deactivated, which means that uh, actually it is not applied and therefore uh, the validation here is okay. Right, so now we have discussed how you can create shapes, the types of shapes and how shapes can target uh, pieces of RDF data in various ways and uh, how the validation result looks like and how it can be customized. So now it is time to uh, discuss actually what can be, what, what are all the things that can be validated using Shackle. Uh, and there are two paths to Shackle. Uh, there is Shackle Core um, with the overview that you can see here. And then there is Shackle Sparkle, which means that you can run an arbitrary Sparkle query uh, on top of the RDF data. And if that query returns something, a violation occurs. I will show you an example of that uh, at the end of this lecture, but the uh, more commonly used path is the Shackle core, which is a set of predefined validators directly in the Shackle specification. And every Shackle validator needs to um, implement those. So what, would, what do we have here? We have uh, value type constraints, uh, which means that we can check that a value is an instance of a certain class or uh, it is a literal uh, with a specific data type or we can check a node kind uh, which is uh, whether it is a literal a blank node or an IRI. Then we can check uh, cardinality constraints so a predicate needs to occur at least this time uh, at least minimum and uh, at, at most maximum times then uh, we are able to check for uh, value range. So when uh, the value is numeric or date or even strings, we can check whether it is in a certain interval. Uh, then there are string-based components, uh, which allow us to check for uh, length of strings, uh, matching of strings to regular expression patterns, uh, checking of language tags, um, another set of uh, constraints regards property pair. So we'll have a property shape focusing on a specific property path. And uh, we'll be able to say that uh, the value on this path is the same as a value on another path or make sure it is disjoint or less than and less than or equal. So we can compare values of two uh, property paths on one node. Then those uh, constraints can be connected using uh, logical uh, constraints. Um, and uh, we have already seen shape-based constraints because those connect node shapes to property shapes. And 
property shapes to node shapes. And um, finally, we can check uh, for constant values using has value. We can check whether a value is in a set of values using in. And uh, with closed and ignored properties, we can say that uh, only the properties covered by shapes can be present in the data and no other. And um, there can be exceptions to this rule, and those are in the ignored properties. So that's an overview. And now uh, let's go through, through those uh, using examples. So in our first example, uh, we'll take a look at the value type. So here we'll have a node shape and uh, targeting Bob, Alice, and Carol. Um, and uh, it will say that Bob, Alice, and Carol need to have an address, which is an instance of a class postal address. So let's take a look at the data graph. There is Alice um, who is a person. Alice is targeted. Now the underlined uh, from now on are the ones causing a violation. So Alice is targeted, but it, uh, she is okay because she doesn't have a path address at all. And there is no min count. So when there is no uh, address, nothing gets validated. Bob has an address and the address is an instance of postal address. So Bob actually fits the shape. And Carol has the address, but the address is not of a type postal address. So Carol causes a violation here. The same thing for data types. So we'll again uh, focus on Alice, Bob, and Carol. And now their age needs to be an integer. So we have already seen this one a little bit. So Alice here fits the shape because she has an age and the, and the age is integer. Bob causes a violation because he has age, but the age is a string, not an integer. And Carol also causes a violation because the number 23 is XSD int, which is a valid XSD data type, but it is not integer. It's a different data type. So again, this causes uh, a violation. Now we can check for kinds of nodes. So those are IRIs, blank nodes, literals, or combinations. So here we'll have a node shape targeting objects of uh, the predicate x knows. And we want to say that the objects of x knows are IRIs. Right, so Bob knows Alice is okay because Alice is targeted, but she is an IRI here. Then Alice knows Bob, and Bob is a literal, not an IRI, so Bob causes a violation here. Now, note that you can use the combinations here, so you can check for blank note or IRI, blank note or literal, or IRI or literal here. Now, we have already seen this one, cardinality constraint. We, we are able to say that on the focus node, in this case, Alice and Bob, um, the predicate name needs to occur at least once. So Alice has a name at least once, that's fine. Bob has a given name, which is not a name, so Bob causes a uh, violation. Uh, the same goes for maximum count. So here we'll target uh, or focus on uh, Bob, and Bob will have to have uh, at most one birth date here. Um, and Bob has at most one birth date, so Bob is fine, and there is no violation here. Now, this is the uh, value range constraint. So uh, we'll have, uh, again, age of, uh, of people as a number. And we'll want to say that the age needs to be between 0 and 150. Uh, OK, so Bob is 23, which is fine. Alice is 220, which is too much. So that's a violation. And Ted um, also causes a violation. Uh, and, but it is not because of uh, the uh, data type, which is string and not the integer. Uh, but it is because uh, when you are comparing strings to integers, there is an order, uh, but the string is never between two numbers. So that actually causes the violation. The comparison operator here uh, to be used is the same one as in Sparkle. So it actually implements some type conversions, but there is an ordering 
um, among banknotes, IRIs, literals, and uh, yeah, and also strings and, and numbers. Right, uh, so also you can check for lengths of strings. So in this case, uh, Bob and Alice have passwords um, between eight and 10 string uh, characters. So Bob is fine, but Alice has her password too long, which causes a violation. Uh, we can also match uh, strings with uh, regular expressions. So in this case, um, uh, yeah, and regular expressions also take flags. So in this case, we are checking the B code property and uh, we want to start with B and the flag I there uh, means that the case is ignored. So it starts with capital B or uh, lowercase b, doesn't matter. So in the data graph, we can see that Bob whose code starts with uh, lowercase b is fine. Alice, whose code starts with uppercase b is fine. But Carol, whose code starts with C is not fine and causes a violation because it doesn't match the pattern. Now, with strings, we can also uh, match language tags. So we can say that a um, certain predicate, such as preferred label, may only be in English and uh, Maori in this case. So uh, here, there are two interesting things. One is that uh, it is a list of language tags which are allowed, and whenever a language tag is outside of that list, it causes a violation. So that's one uh, thing. But if you take a closer look, there is a hill which is New Zealand English. So this is language tag for English with the locale of New Zealand. So technically, if you compare the strings of those language tags, en and en dash and z, those are different. And if you would compare them as strings, you wouldn't get a match. However, Shackle uses the lang matches function from Sparkle. And the lang matches function takes care of the locale here. So actually, en dash and z matches the en in the language there. So a mountain is fine because of the Sparkle language matches functionality. Uh, Berg is not fine because um, the first one doesn't have language tag at all. The second one has a German language tag, and the third one is not a string at all. So Berg causes a violation. Now we may also want to check whether values of some predicate have distinct language tags. So that's uh, what the unique lang uh, switch there is for. So we can say that uh, we have label in multiple languages, but no one language should be uh, used twice. So Alice here has a string, then uh, English text and French text, which is fine. But Bob has two English texts uh, in the label property, which causes a violation here. Uh, right. So. Now uh, we'll talk about the property pair constraints. So you have a value on one property path and you compare it to a value on another property path of the same node. So here we are target Bob and we want to say that uh, the value of first name is or should be the same as the value of a given name, which is the case for our data graph. So there is no violation, but uh, if those values would be different, there would be a violation of of this shape. Uh, we may also want to say that the value found uh, on the path doesn't occur on another path. So that's disjoint. So we have uh, in our data graph USA, which is a prefer preferred label USA, alternate label United States. So those two values are different. So the, the value on pref label is different, disjoint with the value on alt label. However, with Germany, the preferred label and the alternate label are the same, which causes the violation because they should be disjoint. Uh, maybe a note here why it is disjoint and not, not equal. That's because you can have multiple values. So actually uh, those are sets of values. So that's why uh, this is called disjoint. 
Uh, right. And uh, with the property pairs, you can also say that one uh, value should be less than another value, which uh, is handy for time intervals, especially. So here we want to say that start date needs to be less than end date, which is not the case in this case. And therefore, this time interval causes a violation uh, because um, the start date should be less than the end date, and it is not. And there is also a, an, alter, a, an alternative with less than or equals. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, so now we move on to the logical connectives that we can use with, uh, with the individual shapes. Um, so here we'll target the node in the data graph and we'll say that it must not fulfill the shape, the property shape specified. So the property shape specified says that, um, says that uh, there needs to be a property at least once. So there is a property at least once, but the whole shape is connected using not, which means that it should not uh, be fulfilled and it is. And therefore, this causes a, a violation. Now, uh, there was a unary logical co uh, connective. So let's take a look at the binary ones and uh, anary, actually. Um, so here we'll have a super shape that is a node shape and says that on uh, the property uh, um, there needs to be a predicate property at least once and then we'll have an example end shape which will target uh, both instances in the data graph and it will say that both the super shape and another shape saying that the property needs to be there at most once they both need to be fulfilled using the end uh, there can be multiple shapes connected using and and or and the x1 which i'll get to uh, in a bit um, so it is a whole list uh, and here the super shape uh, is uh, is fulfilled for the valid instance because there is property uh, minimal uh, minimal one it is also fulfilled for the invalid instance but for the invalid instance the new shape here is not fulfilled because there are two values for x property and there should be maximum a maximum of one now with the x1 uh, variant here it means that exactly one shape of the list of shapes needs to be fulfilled so not zero and not two just one or exactly one which is different from or because with or uh, any number of shapes can be fulfilled to uh, fulfill the entire or here right so uh this is a bit of a recap because we have already seen how node shapes can be connected to property shapes um so we'll have uh, an address shape here which is a node shape and it connects to a property shape so address shape will focus on some node it is not specified which one but that node will have to have um, a postal code predicate with the data type of the string and at least once uh, at, at most once uh, now we'll have a person shape targeting the class person so all people in the data graph that shape um, or that node needs to have a uh, path address at least once and that value of the address needs to fulfill the address shape node shape connected using shackle node that's a new one that's uh, the one connecting uh, property shapes to node shapes. So let's take a look at the data graph. So Bob is a person, which means that he is targeted by the person shape. Uh, he needs to have at least one address. He has an address, and that's Bob's address. And Bob's address needs to fulfill the address shape. Uh, and uh, does it? Well, it has postal code, it is a string, and it is uh, at most once. So Bob fulfills the shapes. Rito, on the other hand, is a person, so he is targeted by the person shape. He has an address, Rito's address, 
But Redos address doesn't fulfill the address shape because the postal code is an integer and we need it to be a string. Well, uh, in uh, the validation result, it will say that Rito actually doesn't fulfill the uh, person shape here because uh, the validation result points to the uppermost shape, that, that the shape which targets or focuses on a certain node. Uh, the address shape by itself doesn't focus on anything, uh, anything. it inherits the focus nodes uh, from, uh, from the person shape here. Right, so now closed and ignored properties, as I already mentioned, closed uh, shape means that only those properties covered by that shape can be present in the data. So here we have a node shape and it has two property shapes. Uh, one focuses on first name and one focuses on last name, which means that if there is another property other than first name and last name, the shape will cause a violation when it is closed. There is a set of ignored properties, which are the exceptions to this rule, and that set contains one particular predicate, RDF type. Now, Alice has a first name and nothing else, so she passes the validation. Bob has a first name, but also Bob has a middle initial predicate here. Middle initial is not covered by any property shape, and it is also not in the list of ignored properties. Therefore, uh, Bob here causes a uh, violation. Now, we can check for uh, whether a value is a constant, such as here. So we'll target Alice. And we'll say that alumni of needs to have a value of Stanford. Alice has the value of Harvard and Stanford. So this is fine. And there is no violation here. And uh, we can also check for uh, a set of values using the in, um, shackle in predicate, which receives a list of possible values. So here, rainbow pony needs to have a color pink or purple, and our rainbow pony has a color pink, which is okay. It is in the list of permitted values, and therefore no validation, uh, violation here. Right, so uh, now something a bit more interesting, and that's qualified value shape. So what do we have here? <clears throat> well, let's start with the data graph. Uh, we have a um, resource, and this resource has two parents, John and Jane. John is male and Jane is female. Okay, so that's what we have in the data. Now, we want to validate using our shape that uh, there are minimum and maximum two values of parents. So the node has two parents, exactly. And we want to make sure that one of those is actually female. So. Uh, what we do here is that we say min count, max count, that's clear, that we already know. Uh, but we also specify a qualified value shape, which is a shape that <clears throat> that uh, paired with the qualified min count and max count. We can say that it needs to be fulfilled at, uh, at least and at most n times. So here we say that this value shape, that uh, the value has a property gender uh, with the value female, needs to be fulfilled at least once. So what this entire shape says is that um, the node needs to have two parents and at least one of those parents needs to be a female, which is the case with the qualified value shape example that it shows over there. Uh, so uh, there is no violation here. There is one extension to this and uh, we will illustrate it on a, an example of a hand. So you'll have a hand with five digits or fingers. Uh, and we'll say that uh, uh, you see that there are two. Uh, those are both the same shapes graph. It just didn't fit in one column, so I split it. So there is no data graph. This is one shapes graph. And there are two property shapes connected to, to that uh, node shape. Uh, both focus on the path digit uh, and both have a qualified value shape. But one says that 
the class of the value of the predicate digit needs to be sum, uh, and uh, minimum and maximum is one. So the hand needs to have one thumb, and uh, it also needs to have four fingers. That's the other property shape. But the new thing here is the qualified value shapes disjoint, which is set to true on both of those shapes. If that was not there, we could have a hand with uh, four fingers. And one of those fingers could be both a finger and a thumb, which is something we do not want. Because if we had that case, it would fit fit uh, this shape because one of those will be a thumb which is okay and also that shape because four of those will be fingers but it would still not be a, a proper hand so we are able to say with the qualified value shape is joined true that the one qualified value shape uh, actually needs to focus on a disjoint set of values uh, disjoint with the set of values on which the sibling qualified value shape uh, focuses on. So it means that when this one matches uh, one of the digits, one of the fingers, uh, a thumb, then the four over there needs to match other fingers, not the one that is already matched by the first value shape. So this may come in handy sometimes to say that those two need to match on disjoint values. So that was the entire shackle core part. So those are the predefined shackle validators present in every uh, shackle uh, validator implementation. Now, uh, there is another part of shackle called shackle sparkle, which uh, also utilizes arbitrary sparkle queries that can be executed on top of the data and result in some uh, violations. So how it looks like is uh, this. This is a simple example um, where we have a node shape targeting countries, which are the countries in the data graph. And there is a shackle sparkle uh, shape uh, connected or, or constraint connected saying, uh, well, there is message, doesn't matter. There is a definition of prefixes used in the query. And then there is a, a sparkle select query. Now, the interesting part about this query are those dollar prefixed variables. Those dollar prefixed variables are filled in in the query at the time of execution by the shackle validator. And um, dollar this actually fills in the focus node on which the shackle shape is applied. So what it does is it looks at uh, this, which is the focus node, German label and value, and uh, it will return um, this value whenever the value is not a literal or actually it doesn't match a German language tag. So whenever it is not a literal or it is a literal but not with a German language tag, this query will return uh, a result with this, that's the focus node. Then German label as path, that's a constant, but it's the path variable and value is the return value which is not a literal or doesn't fit or doesn't have the German language tag. Whenever this Sparkle select query returns a result, this result becomes a validation uh, result. So that represents a violation. So you can see that uh, you can have a much more complex Sparkle query detecting some arbitrary uh, violations uh, like this. So what it does here with the valid country, it is a country. So X valid country gets substituted for dollar this, uh, both in the select query and uh, select path and the where path. And uh, German label is there and it is a literal with the uh, German language tag. So it actually does not match the filter and for valid country, the Sparkle query does not produce any result, and therefore valid country is really valid. Invalid country has the German label, but it is a value with the English language tag, which means it doesn't fit the filter. Uh, actually, it does fil fit the filter because uh, the language matches doesn't match. It is a negation there. So this produces a result 
where invalid country is this, German label is path, and Spain with the English language tag is the value. And therefore, this causes a violation, which will look like this. It is a uh, validation result, violation, uh, and the focus node is the invalid country. The result path is what, whatever was returned by the Sparkle query, which in this case is X German label. The value is the value which caused the violation, which is the Spain with the English language tag. And the constraint component is the Sparkle constraint component because we use Sparkle and validator and the shape links to the uh, language example shape. So again, like this, we can also validate using arbitrary uh, Sparkle uh, queries. Now, the most complex example I will show you today is this one where we actually can create our own validator using Sparkle and even pass that validator some parameters. So here we are creating uh, a validator to be used in our shapes graph later. Uh, we will say that it has one parameter, which is xlang. So we'll accept lang as a parameter to our validator. It is a string with uh, the length of two. It is a name and description for, for people. And uh, then we'll add a property validator, which is a Sparkle Select validator. And in this Sparkle Select, we again give a Sparkle Select query. But here, notice that the lang here with the, uh, or prefix with the dollar sign is actually, or represents the value of the length parameter that we'll get later. So here we actually check for, uh, again, values with some language tag, but that language tag is not fixed in the Sparkle query to be the German language tag. It is a language tag that we get as a parameter in our shapes graph when we use this validator. So this is the definition of the validator, and here is the usage. So we'll have a node shape targeting, again, countries, and it will have uh, two property shapes, uh focusing on german label and english label predicates and now because here we use on that shape x lang which is the parameter defined by our component the shackle validator knows that it needs to pass this this value which is the e in the first place and en in the second case to uh to that validator in the lang attribute and use that validator uh, on uh, as a shape so like this, uh, you can actually create your own validators using Sparkle in Shaco. Right, so that was it for Shaco. Uh, that was what the specification allows you to do. Now to uh, implementations, there are various Shaco implementations in various triple stores. For instance, in those two uh, that we have already talked about, Apache Jena and Eclipse RD4J, there are implementations of Shackle, which you can use. Um, they differ in the way uh, they are executed, actually. Uh, in Jena, there is one a straightforward way. There is a command line tool that uh, allows you to specify the shapes graph and the data graph as two turtle files, and it will produce the validation result, again, as an RDF graph. So that's straightforward. Um, with um, uh, with uh, triple stores that are already online um, or uh, create, well, you need to create them in a special way to actually enable the Shackle functionality. So in RD4J, you need to use the Shackle sale repository type. Uh, and then when you actually uh, commit the shapes graph into a special predefined graph with that IRI that you can see there, the validation will be executed and the report will be returned. Uh, in uh, Apache Jena, you can again post the shapes graph to a uh, <clears throat> special API, which will cause the validation to run. Um, to play with Chaco, it is easier to use um, some online tools, which basically are two windows, one for the shapes graph, one for the data graph, and you'll see the validation result right away. 
I recommend uh, the Zuko Shaco Playground. It's, it has some minor bugs, but generally it works quite okay. And uh, you can use that one to, to play with Shaco. Uh, one final remark using uh, regarding Shaco is that uh, you might have noticed that uh, the sh some of the shapes, especially some more complex ones, are quite uh, complex to represent in RDFs like that. Um, so uh, some people have noticed that as well and devised a special syntax called Shackle C or Shackle Compact syntax that looks like on um, looks like this. It is not RDF. It is a special syntax for Shackle rules. It actually is able to represent only a subset of what you are able to represent in Shackle. But uh, it is uh, more readable. So, for instance, what you can see on the right hand side is the same uh, set of shaco shapes as on the left hand side. So, you can see that it is shorter and uh, yeah, more readable. However, not every shaco validator actually implements this and it is not a standard. So, it is just a note that uh, it exists so that you are not surprised when you see it someone, somewhere <coughs> used. Uh, right, so that's it for for Shaco. Any questions? Maybe the most interesting for you is that the uh, usage of Shaco is not part of your semester project. So uh, this is just so that you know that it exists and can be used for uh, validation of RDF data. Let's now uh, discuss. Um, Mapping from relational database. Right, so the situation now that we have data in our relational database, we are able to access the database using SQL, and we want to get um, RDF data out of the database. Now, there will be two approaches to this one will be fully automatic so we'll just point at the database and we'll want to get rdf data just like that uh, and uh, then the second one will allow allow us to actually customize the transformation a little bit so that we will be able to use our own vocabularies and predicates and classes and so on so that we can get um, a reasonable rdf representation uh, out of the relational database uh, now, what we will work with? Well, we'll work with uh, relational tables. So, for instance, here we'll have a table EMP for employees, which will have those columns uh, EM, uh, employee number. It is uh, an integer, which is a data type, right? It is a primary key. Uh, then uh, we'll have a name and job and department number. Uh, now, department number actually is a foreign key. It re references a value in another table, department. And uh, again, department has a department number as a primary key, and it has a department name and location, for instance. So we'll have uh, two relational tables. We'll have data types, primary keys, and foreign keys, and uh, table names. And that's it. That's what we have to work with. And. Uh, one straightforward way of actually uh, doing something. Uh, <clears throat> oh, uh, let's let, uh, let's uh, take it from another angle. What we would like to be able to do is get RDF data out of uh, the relational database that looks like this. Uh, we'll want to be able to uh, to uh, use our own IRIs for individual entities. Now, in relational database. The entities are typically represented by rows of a table. There might be multiple entities on one row, but let's say for simplicity that uh, we'll have one entity per row. So we want to be able to say how the IRI of the entity coming from that row looks like. Um, then uh, we would like to be able to use our own vocabulary so that we can say that, for instance, name here uh, should be from our vocabulary X, or it should be from FOV and so on. So say which vocabulary should be used for which value. 
Um, then we would like to be able to utilize foreign keys. So the fact that uh, employee the reference is a department in the department table, we would like to be able to, uh, to use that fact. And finally, uh, we would also like to be able to compute some values on top of that relation database and have this computed value represented in RDF. For instance, here for each department, we would like to compute how many employees that department has that is not directly stored in the relation database. So we need to compute that first to be able to put it in uh, the resulting RDF. Right. So the way we will go about it is uh, demonstrated here. Uh, we will have we will create a, a mapping, mapping from the structure of the relational database to our uh, representation in RDF. So one of those mappings can be, for instance, something you already know, which is a Parco script that is also a mapping from a CSV file to an RDF representation. But here we will use another vocabulary for that. And uh, <clears throat> we will have our relational database, which accepts SQL queries and returns relational table results. And uh, we want to use that mapping to actually create a Sparkle endpoint that will return RDF data as we are used to. And the software that will make this happen is called a wrapper. So the wrapper points at a uh, relational database it accepts a mapping and it allows us to uh, actually answer Sparkle queries um, and return RDF data. So that's what we will work with here. And we'll start with direct mapping. Direct mapping is a web standard by the W3C consortium. Um, <clears throat> and this one is for the automatic way of actually getting RDF out of a relational database. Of course, when I say automatic, it means that uh, lots of stuff will be missing in the export because there will be no customization, so no custom vocabularies, no custom IRIs. Uh, it will be just a syntactic transformation of data from the relational database to RDF. But it will be automatic, so no configuration, almost no configuration needed. Of course, we need to point that software implementing direct mapping to the database, right? So that uh, it knows which database it should convert, but then it, it will be automatic. So let's have a relation database like this one. We have people and we have addresses. People have ID, name, and uh, address, which is a foreign key, is a reference to the table addresses. And addresses have ID, city, and state where ID are, is, a, is a primary key here. So a same database like this can be created by a SQL script that looks like this. It creates the tables and then it fills in the, uh, the data. So this is simple. And uh, now let's take a look at how an automatic conversion of the data can look like in RDF. Well, uh, so we have those two tables and we already said that probably uh, each row of each table will represent an entity, uh, an RDF resource. So the first thing we need to uh, determine is what IRI will be used for that resource. Well, if it, is, it, <clears throat> if it is to be automatic, we have only what is in the relation database to work with. So, um, the, uh, there will be some default base IRI. Uh, there is a, actually a default in the specification or in uh, some of the implementations, which is foo example slash db. But um, that is one of the parameters that you actually can give to the implementation. So that's the base IRI. There is no information in the relational database to, to determine this. So that's one parameter. Now that we have the base IRI, all the rest of the IRIs will be relative to that base IRI. Well, and uh, what we have here is the name of the table and name of the columns and the values in those columns. So the IRI will consist of the base, then the name of the table, then a slash, 
and then name of the column containing a primary key an equal sign and then the value of this primary key because that is unique for a given relation database so that's the iri for the ent uh, entity representing the row of uh, the relational table now we need a type the type is represented by the name of the table itself so that's how we get our first triple so we have people slash id equals seven for the first row of the people table and it is of a type people because that's the name of the table now <clears throat> the rest is, uh, means um, representing the values in each column in rdf so that's quite straightforward so we need to determine iris of the predicates which are the name of the table hash and the name of the column so people id value is seven now um, in a relational schema we also have data types so we know that id here is a number so we use that information also in rdf so you can see that seven here is actually an integer then we have name bob and we have um, address which is 18 that's um, all we have for the first row but there is one more piece of information and that is that actually the 18 there is a foreign key to the addresses table so besides having 18 as um, as a value of the column we we'll also have a link here there is a ref dash and uh, the name of uh, the attribute representing that that is a foreign key and the value there is the id of the entity coming from the reference row of the addresses table which is addresses slash id equals 18 which we can see on the bottom uh, bottom part of the slide here and then it is again straightforward because another row of people is uh, with id 8 it is of a type people id is 8 and name is sue and address is null so there is no reference to anywhere else so nothing gets outputted and the addresses has only one row 18 so uh, it is three values no links anywhere and um, id is a primary key which means it gets used in the iris of entities coming out of that so this is quite a straightforward way of actually uh, converting a relational database into rdf it is not all there are some edge cases which we will go through now for instance uh, it might happen that um, in a relational database we have multiple keys on one table so here the department has a primary key which is id and then it has a unique key which is name and city so we may use both to actually reference department and that is what is happening here people uh, the people table has a id name and address as before but now it has also a department name and department city which together is a foreign key to the department table uh, the change is visible here uh, with the bold uh, triple because there um, we can see how a, a semicolon is used in the url um, which is used for concatenating multiple column values basically so here because the reference is from multiple columns the multiple column names are concatenated with uh, the semicolon and used in the uri saying that the reference is from those two uh, column names and then it works the same way so um, it knows which uh, which entity iri will get exported from the department table so it references uh, references it correctly also in the rdf output uh, so this is handling multiple uh, multiple column keys now uh, there can be also multiple column primary keys so that's handled the same way so here we all have a primary key which is not id but it is name and city which means that uh, it affects the iri of the outputted entity and uh, here we'll have uh, basically the again the name of the column and the value there as we had before but then we'll have the semicolon and the name and the value of the other columns uh, creating the prime or com uh, comprising the primary key so like this the iri of the entity is still unique 
because we know that the combination of name and city is unique because it is a primary key in the database. Right. Another case that might happen is that uh, a table uh, doesn't have a primary key. Uh, that is, of course, not recommended in relational databases, but it is possible and is allowed. So here we have a table of tweets where we have a tweeter, when, and text. And there is no primary key, which means that there is no value that can create a unique identifier of that particular role, which means that in RDF, we have a construct for that. It's a blank node. So if we do not have a primary key, uh, the resulting data will contain blank nodes like these. Um, yeah. Um, and that's it. The rest is the same. Also note that for date time in SQL, there is also a, a proper data type, which again gets used in the output RDF. Well, uh, one interesting thing is that uh, even if a table has no primary keys, uh, it can be referenced using unique keys. We have seen that before. But uh, here, projects actually have no primary key, which means that the entities will be blank nodes. However, it still has two unique keys, one leader name, and one is uh, name, department name, and department city. And this name, uh, department name, and department city is uh, actually used from, uh, to, to reference values from the project um, in the task assignments table here. Um, the interesting thing is, is that even though uh, from projects we get blank nodes, we can reference those values and those values get referenced correctly. So here the blank node C gets referenced, um, well, correctly. So it is not necessary to have IRIs to be able to uh, export connected, uh, connected records. Right, so that was it. That was direct mapping all, and all the edge cases that may happen in a relation database. So uh, with a direct mapping implementation, you really just specify the base IRI and you point the implementation to a relation database and that's it. You will get an RDF representation of the database according to uh, the rules that we have discussed. So that's quite straightforward, automatic, of course. As you have seen, the predicates and the classes are uh, or do not use any vocabularies common on the web. So it is just a syntactic conversion which needs to be refined later. So that's one option actually. Uh, when you uh, convert a relation database to RDF, you use direct mapping and then you use Sparkle to shape the RDF data using vocabularies and so on. Another way of doing this is actually using R2RML, which uh, again is a web standard and it allows you to customize the mapping uh, so that uh, you get a better looking RDF. Now, actually, those two standards, direct mapping and R2RML, are uh, like sister standards. Um, they were released together and uh, they are interconnected. Uh, basically, if you take the rules that make direct mapping, that is one of the mappings that can be used by R2RML, but you can customize it uh, in R2RML. So uh, the overview of the R2RML vocabulary, it will be again an RDF vocabulary. So the R2RML mapping is specified as RDF data. Um, so the overview looks like this. The basic, well, the, the cornerstone of uh, this vocabulary is the triple map up there. So the triple map actually contains the specification of how to produce RDF triples out of the relational database. We will start with a simple example here. So we'll have a triple map. And uh, the first thing here is that it will point to a table in the relational database that it will process. In this case, it is uh, directly a relational table called EMP here. Um, so here, this triple map will process the table EMP. Now, there is a subject map which says how the subject 
object of the produced triplets should look like. Here, we use a template, which is a string template. Um, <clears throat> and uh, notice that curly braces with empno in the template, that will get replaced with the value of the column empno. So this is how the subject produced out of the rows of the, of the table will look like. Uh, and uh, on top of that, we can say that uh, the entities from those, uh, from those rows will be of a class employee, which is from any vocabulary we want. So uh, in our instance is an example, but it uh, could as well be full person or something like that. So that is the specification of, uh, of subjects, of the entities. Now we need to specify also the values. So the predicates and the objects. For that, we have the predicate object map. And here we specify that uh, we'll produce uh, predicates X name and the objects will be generated by an object map. And this is again a simple one because it just takes the value of the column E name, which means that together we will create subjects uh, whose IRIs look like this. They will be of a type employee and they, they will have a predicate name with the value from the column E name. So the result will look something like what is, uh, what is done there. So we'll have the IRI according to the template. Uh, if Smith has the MP number 7369, it will be used for the IRI. Uh, Smith will be an employee and will have a name from the E name column, which we presume contains the value Smith. So like this, we can customize uh, the transformation the mapping. So let's now explore some other options because this was the simplest case, right? So another option is that we can actually, instead of specifying a, a single table from the relation database, we are able to run a Sparkle, uh, sorry, a SQL select query, uh, which will compute a new table because in relation database, the results of a SQL query are other tables. So again, this will generate another table, which will get used in a triples map. So the difference here is that uh, instead of specifying the table name, we specify a SQL query, which will get run, and, and the result will be used for the mapping. So here we have another triples map, which references the table view, that's the query that we ran. And uh, we'll have a subject map. Now we'll create departments. We'll have a predicate object map saying that uh, the department name is from the column D name, which was computed in the query before. And we'll have the location from the column lock. Uh, and we'll have, um, uh, so that was again computed in, in, the, in the SQL query. And we also have uh, the predicate staff from the column staff, which is the number of people in the department. And that was again computed um, in this query, right? So in this query, we have department number, department, department name, location, and then we count the number of employees in the department and we store that in the staff column. <clears throat> so we compute something and we use that something in the predicate object map here, which gives us what we wanted in the beginning, which is the number one here, representing one person in that department computed from, from the database. So it is not just a simple mapping. We can also compute something in the database before using it uh, in RDF. Right. We can also use uh, the references in um, or between relational tables. So here we'll have a predicate object map that will produce uh, values for the predicate department and the values uh, are actually results of a join um, in SQL uh, between this triples map and the table that uh, it processes and another triples map and the other table that it processes based on the equality of uh, the department numbers. Um, so here we'll uh, produce links uh, based on a join in, uh, in the SQL query. Right, we have already seen that we can compute uh, a uh, logical table uh, using SQL and then use it in, uh, in uh, a triples map. 
Now, what we haven't discussed is that formally, uh, the subject map, the predicate object map, and the object map, they are all called term maps. Uh, so a term map is either a subject map, a predicate object map, an object map, or a graph map, which we'll see in, in a little bit. And for each term map, regardless of what it is, uh, we actually are able to specify that the value should be a, the produced value in RDF should be a constant, a value from a column, a value based on a template, which we, are, we have already seen for, uh, for IRIs of subjects. Uh, we are able to specify the time type, so we uh, can say that the result should be an IRI, a blank note, or a literal with a language tag or a data type. Now, there is a last option, inverse expression, which is kind of complex, so uh, let's skip it for, for simplicity. Uh, right, so term type, again, similar to node kind in Shackle, right? So term type can be IRI or blank note for subjects, uh, IRI for predicates, and uh, IRI blank note or literal for objects, and uh, naturally IRI for a, a graph uh, when we are processing or producing quads instead of triples. Um, right, so for instance, here we have an object map where we have a template which works like it worked for IRIs, but this time we say that the term type is literal and we can produce uh, like a decorated title uh, like this. Um, we could also switch it to IRI, but this is not as syntactically correct uh, IRI, so it wouldn't work, uh, but we have seen the usage with IRI in, in subject maps already. Now, we have already noticed that in relational schema, there's a specification of data types for, for each column, and there is a mapping in the specification between the relational or SQL data types and the RDF data types. We have seen the date used, we have seen the uh, numeric value used. Um, there might be some lexical transformations involved, for instance, for timestamps. Because uh, in SQL, when we have a timestamp, there is no T symbol between the date and the time. But uh, in RDF, we use the XSD date time for that. And there is a T sign or character uh, in the middle. So sometimes the values need to be transformed a little bit, or, or booleans need to be lowercase for RDF and so on. Uh, but typically, uh, those data types fit uh, quite nicely, and we are able to to specify the data type of a resulting literal using the uh, data type predicate in the object map. Right, and the last thing is uh, that we can say that specific triples produced by a triples map should uh, go uh, into a specific named graph when we are, we are producing quads. So here, actually inside a subject map, we say that the produced triple goes into a graph department graph. Um, the graph can also be specified not by a constant, but by a value from the relation database um, or by a template, uh, like we can see in the last, last case. So like this, we can split the resulting triples into, uh, into various named graphs. Right, and that's it. So uh, that is R2RML, a way of actually mapping a relational database data uh, into, uh, into RDF. Now, if you want to see a live demo, uh, see the YouTube video from last year, where I actually showed on a simple sports database uh, how these can be run. It is quite straightforward. So uh, this year I'm skipping the live demonstration. Uh, but it is just basically writing this mapping and running the software, pointing it to a relational database and seeking the resulting RDF data. So if you are ever in a situation where you need to produce RDF data out of a relational database, know that there are actually three ways of doing that. One is R2RML, one is direct mapping, and one is dumping the database in a CSV file and running Tarkle on top of it. So there are options. Any questions? If not, I'll see you uh, today uh, in the evening at the tutorial.
please have a look at uh, the web page because today we will be working with Java and uh, the libraries for RDF uh, in Java. And uh, as you know, the Wi-Fi in the lab is a little bit slow. Uh, and uh, so just make sure that uh, you are ready for, uh, for the tutorial. So have uh, Java installed, have uh, Eclipse or IntelliJ installed, and have the uh, Eclipse RDF for J or Apache General Libraries or both download it uh, ideally before the tutorial. There are links on the on the web page, so it should be quite quite straightforward. Okay, if there are no more questions. 